Hey everyone, I am uh, Nikunj Raghuvanshi. I'll be talking today about interactive sound simulation. And the idea is to use physical simulation of how, how sounds are produced and propagate and are perceived in virtual and game environments to make them much more immersive. So a little bit about me to start off. I'm a principal researcher in the Microsoft Research Interactive Media Group since 2009, where we do a lot of interdisciplinary work, mixing computer graphics, vision, and audio modeling. And before that, I was a PhD at UNC Chapel Hill, where um, I initiated the direction of sound simulation research there. And my main interest through the years has been on efficient modeling uh, of various physical phenomena especially uh, on sound propagation, which is going to be a, the bulk of the talk today, the second half. So here's a quick rundown of today's agenda. Um, first, I'll start very broadly. I'll talk about interactive simulation in general and the challenges that are faced when you try to do fast simulation in real time. And those challenges are shared across, uh, across different kinds of simulation. And then I'll switch to an overview of interactive sound simulation, its various components, and then give you a flavor of the research in each of those components. And then we'll go deeper into sound propagation. And finally, I'll conclude with some outlook for the future and which directions the research is heading. So let's start talking about interactive experiences. So they can be defined as opposed to linear media, like movies or video or TV, which are fixed experiences that are one way, just from um, the screen or the experience to the viewer. Whereas interactive experiences, uh, such as games and virtual reality, are much more interactive and participatory. In fact, in a multiplayer game, you can have multiple people interacting within an environment in unpredictable ways. So in linear media, because everything is fixed, an artist can more easily fake various effects to create realism and immersion. Whereas in interactive media, that can be almost impossible. And it becomes really important to have some kind of physical modeling. That is modeling how the world should behave, how different events should make the environment react, and what sort of sensory perception people get. And so the goal is to convince perception, to create renderings that are believable to people. And uh, physics is required to do that because our perception is trained every day by looking at environments around us. So in terms of practice, the biggest platforms for doing interactive simulation are game engines like Unity and Unreal. And over the last many decades, a lot of work has been done on various aspects of visual simulation such as modeling shapes, like this background picture is a, a screenshot from a real-time demo that recently came out for Unreal Engine 5. And you can see it's very realistic. You have all these details on these shapes. Uh, there's a lot of collision modeling, say rocks are falling on these walls, how they collide uh, with the environment. And light simulation, how it bounces around the scene and casts shadows and uh, creates very convincing lighting. And this, doing this in real time is a huge challenge. The three top technical issues. The first one is that these scenes are very complex in general. So any practical technique needs to handle very general scenes. And it needs to handle them and produce believable and uh, immersive renderings. And robustness is a very important concern that you shouldn't have corner cases where suddenly it produces something different and wrong because a perception latches on to anything out of the ordinary. So that is a very high bar to cross. And you have to do both of these things and their intention with efficiency. You have to do it fast at 30 to 60 frames a second. So there's a lot of innovation that has happened in designing efficient algorithms that do clever approximations with knowledge of phys the physical phenomena themselves, as well as lockstep um, growth in hardware in graphics processors to do this processing. But these are all the technical sides of making this feasible. A system can meet all these requirements and still fail in the real world because there's also a set of practical requirements to make such systems feasible. A big, a big point here is automation. The technique shouldn't require too much manual work or tagging of the environment to make it work because then that just replaces one kind of work with another. 
pinging to the right, uh, there should be nice integration in existing tools. So there's a gradual path to adoption. Instead of requiring you to throw away all the tools you had, start with new ones and retrain people to use those new tools. And these things come together in the hands of the designer uh, who needs to be able to wield some uh, kind of control on the physical simulation. It can't simply be like, this is what the simulation gave us, we go with that because at the end of the day, these are designed experiences. So all these six uh, considerations go into any kind of interactive simulation and they apply just as well to sound simulation, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So here's the big picture of sound simulation uh, and how to do it interactively. So usually it is modeled as a feedforward pipeline. Uh, it has three components. There's sound synthesis, which is how sounds are created. Say you clap in a room, then from there sounds propagate or move in an environment to get to the listener, that is sound propagation. And once they arrive around the listener, um, they need to be displayed to the user through either headphones or speakers, which is spatialization. The path of sound simulation has been, has seen more ups and downs compared to visual simulation. There was a lot of uh, uh, fast technology development in the 90s, but uh, since around 2005, the emphasis has been more on making new design tools, interactive audio design tools, uh, different from, say, movies. And examples of such tools are Audio Kinetic Wise and FMOD, which are used a lot in games these days. And if you want to know more about this history, you should definitely check out uh, this talk I've referred here. But since 2015, the field has seen a resurgence because in large part from virtual and mixed reality. And part of the reason is that spatialization technology has matured. So there's technology like Dolby Atmos and Windows Sonic that provide spatialization to all users. For example, in Windows 10 in spatial sound, you can find these settings to turn them on. And what that does is this higher quality display through spatialization sets the stage for better simulation because now you can, um, the a better simulation seem so much nicer to the user because they come across better. And around the same time, many propagation technologies have also shipped, which I'll talk about. Another positive development is next generation consoles have hardware acceleration for audio. So we're starting to see that virtual cycle, just like graphics of better algorithms and better immersion and better hardware support. So before I go further, let me give you an example of what I mean by an interactive sound simulation. This particular simulation is with Project Acoustics and Unreal Engine. I'll, I'll talk about those. Do use headphones to listen to this demo and all the demos I'm going to show today. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is there's only one sound source in a cave. It's just a drip sound. And you're just walking around this environment and what I want you to listen for is just how much immersion is added by modeling how the sound echoes through the space, how it's obstructed by various surfaces, and especially in combination and visuals, how well it conveys this sense of presence in an environment to you. So as you heard, you get a very immersive sense of the sound as you go close, as you go far away, it gets more reverberant and so on. And, and that's the goal of interactive sound simulation is to produce these immersive renderings without requiring any manual work. So for example, in this case, this was all done through simulation on the geometry you saw with the materials it had uh, without any hand tuning on top of it. 
So here's the structure of the rest of the talk. Um, I told you about these three components. So first I'll talk about uh, sound synthesis, give you some flavor of the research there. I'll talk very briefly about spatialization, and then I'll go to propagation and talk more in detail about, about that. So let's talk about sound synthesis, or it's uh, as it's called in audio circles, physical modeling synthesis. And the idea is to follow the physics of how sounds are produced, which is, for example, when you strike a bell, its surface starts to vibrate. And then those vibrations push and pull the air around the bell. And as that happens, air compresses and rarefies. And these compressions and rarefactions, pressure fluctuations in the air, that is sound that's perceived by our ears as sound. So to model this physics, there are many efficient algorithms. One of them is modal synthesis for quasi-rigid objects. And here's a quick intuition of what it is. So if suppose you have a one-dimensional string like a guitar string and you want to model its vibrations, what you can do is break down its vibration into these elementary modes of vibration uh, over space. And then any vibration of the string can be expressed as a sum of these vibrations. So I'm going to play this. So each of these elementary modes is producing a corresponding sound to the right, which is a damped sinusoid. And if you sum those damp sinusoids, you get the overall sound that the string produced. So you can see initially in the sound, there's a lot of transient structure. That's like the click sound when you do the strike. After that, it's followed by this long harmonic oscillation. That's the ringing of the bell afterwards. So this was in one dimension, but it does generalize to three dimensions. So these are the mode shapes of a bowl, for example. Um, and here's a quick demo from some work I did many years ago, just to show you what modal synthesis uh, can do. So you have three materials, wood, metal, and plastic, and various objects. And this is just a sandbox in which you're just doing freeform interaction with these objects. And they're responding to collisions like they would using a physics engine in a game. So as you can see, you, you get this very nuanced, synchronized effects between visuals and audio, like how the sound responds to the rolling speed of an object or objects of various materials colliding with each other directly through simulation. And again, this is just directly from the geometry of the objects and the material parameters for each. But industrial uptake for such uh, physically based methods has been limited. The, it's very common still to use pre-made sounds such as in a digital audio workstation, much like movies. And then based on game events that happen like collisions, you trigger a pre-baked sound. So you don't get as much granularity in the simulation as a result. And this is my opinionated view of why the situation is uh, like that. Partly, it's again going back to this rubric of what makes a technique practical. So in terms of gen general scenes and believability and in terms of automation, uh, the techniques can be pretty good, especially modal synthesis. But when it comes to efficiency, it really depends on what you're talking about. For rigid body sounds, modal synthesis is close enough, although perhaps it needs even more optimizations to make it practical. But for example, on the other extreme, water sounds are really, really difficult. Uh, the physics is really much more complicated. And then there's the question of tools integration, making it so that it's, such physical synthesis is easy to use uh, within existing uh, game engines, uh, like taking the data from the collision physics and having it routed to the physical simulation system. That can be difficult, and you can also face limitations there of just, uh, that, for example, that the physics runs at 30 frames a second and not at much higher rates that audio can perhaps need. And finally, because of this, like we haven't uh, dug very deep into what sort of design controls you might need. If somebody, if an artist says, uh, I want control on these physical sounds in such and such way, uh, we haven't established a vocabulary for doing that. I should mention that there's um, good work right now on procedural audio, which is the broader goal of having physically inspired methods that 
um, just produce synchronized audio with visuals in, with some parametric control. And some work is happening there. And perhaps, and these methods are much more practical today. So perhaps um, a good way to look at it is starting with these methods and making them more and more physically um, accurate or more and more physically based. Uh, and th perhaps that's the way to go. So for further reading, I refer you to the excellent book from Perry Cook that's up top. Uh, that's a good uh, overview of real-time synthesis. The two papers after that are seminal papers in the area of using rigid, efficient rigid body sound synthesis. Uh, the paper after that is some of my work, which I showed you the demo of. And this system is less accurate, but it's, it can be much easier to implement as well. And for the latest research in the area, I'd refer you to work from Dr. Doug James and his students who've done a synthesis for all sorts of uh, interesting phenomena like liquids and cloth and thin shells and so on. All right, so that was synthesis. Let's now move to sound spatialization. So somebody did a simulation using synthesis propagation, and we know the sound field around the listener. It's the job of a spatializer to take that field and convert it to signals that should be played over headphones or over speakers to recreate the impression. So usually this, uh, a spatializer will have all kinds of signal processing algorithms to do this transformation. And it's more heavy on signal processing rather than physical simulation itself. To give you a flavor of the current research, and keep in mind this is a much uh, vaster area than one slide would <laughs> uh, convey. So it's, uh, I've just picked a, a few things here. So it's not a complete description. But there are two related problems that people are looking at. One is the problem of sound field representation, which is that what do you represent this input sound field in the form of? And a classic way to do that is channel-based. So for example, in a 5.1 surround system, you have five directions, and you just uh, produce five signals, saying what came from front, front left, and so on. This can be less accurate because for intermediate directions, you interpolate or pan into the, onto these directions. The other extreme is object-based, where you break down the whole sound field into elementary events. So for example, if you have a forest scene, each bird is a sound source. Each leaf's rustling is a sound source. So obviously, this is very high fidelity, but it can also get very expensive. And then there's modal techniques, which has connections to modal synthesis that I described to you, uh, where you take the spherical sound field and represent it as a sum or linear combination of many elementary um, basis functions on the sphere, for example, spherical harmonics. So all these methods have different trade-offs in terms of how compact the representation is, how much the rendering cost is, what the render quality is, <clears throat> and finally, design controls, because channel-based, for example, is very intuitive to think about, whereas modal can be less intuitive to think about. So there's a lot of uh, research going on in industry and academia to figure out what is a good solution going forward for immersive audio. And then there are spatialization algorithms that take these sound fields as input. And I'm going to give you a brief sense of uh, HRTFs, head-related transfer functions, which are used for binaural rendering over headphones, which is because of virtual reality, there is a lot of research going on in this area right now. And the idea of HRTFs is you can tabulate how the head and shoulders of a person modify sound coming from a specific direction as it scatters from the head and the ears. And that's the HRTF. And then um, at runtime, based on wherever a source is, you figure out the filter for the left and right ear and do a convolution of the sound source uh, sources signal with the corresponding filters. And that creates the two signals you should send in because it recreates what would happen in reality. And this can create very impressive effects which where sound sources are externalized and have a very crisp direction. But uh, here are some questions that people are looking at. So firstly, um, HRTFs depend on the person's head size, their pinna shape, and all these considerations. So the question is how much and how to personalize these HRTFs in a practical way. And how much do you need that for various applications, say virtual reality as opposed to mixed reality, where you can actually hear real sounds and perhaps the bar for realism is much higher to convince somebody that a virtual sound is also located in the same space. 
There's other related questions like coloration that HRTFs always have to introduce some sort of equalization uh, and making that perceptually transparent can be tricky in practice. There's the question of localization accuracy, uh, how high fidelity does the HRTF need to be? And all these questions basically can be framed into one big question. What makes an HRTF good enough? Uh, what is the accuracy bound you need? And how does that vary depending on the application? And again, this, this is, these are a few questions. There's a lot of uh, hard questions in this area and a lot of work is going on in that field right now. And then these problems are interconnected. How do you represent the field and what specialization algorithms you need? The, the answer to all of this is uh, perhaps one answer or a set of consistent answers. So for further reading, I'd refer you to these two books up top, uh, which are about the psychophysics of hearing and then more practical aspects of it. And this is not an exhaustive list, by the way. These are just some interesting readings that I picked out. Uh, the third one is uh, Ville Pulke's uh, classic paper on VBAP for speaker panning. The fourth in the list is uh, research that's going on uh, in Microsoft in the audio and acoustics group uh, on HRTF modeling and binaural rendering. And a lot of this technology has shipped in Microsoft HoloLens for producing spatial audio renderings. So there's a link that, to that work. But really there's a lot going on and the best way to know about it is to is conference proceedings or to attend conferences like AES conventions, AVAR, and IEEE ICASP. Uh, any talk about 3D audio or spatial audio is talking about HRTFs in some sense. And AES AVAR is coming up uh, very soon, so I encourage you to attend that. All right, so I talked about synthesis and spatialization. Let's now start digging into sound propagation, which is how does sound move once it's produced from a sound source, how does it move through a space to get to the listener? There's been a lot of work on this in the area of room acoustics. And the picture on the right is taking, taken from the cover art of the book by Kutruf. I highly recommend reading this book cover to cover if you're interested in the area. And the typical problem here is you have a concert hall and you have a sound source stay on the stage and there's a listener sitting on a seat and you want to predict, you want to do a predictive simulation of how, what the listener's perception would be of, of that space. To do that, it's very common to use um, high frequency approximations to, actual, to the actual wave equation, uh, which, is, which is ray tracing. And that makes some modeling some diffraction, wave effects like diffraction difficult, but it's a very efficient method. So what you do is these, you trace these ray paths from source to listener, and as they bounce around the scene, they model reverberation and interesting cues like that. So ray tracing is a good fit for room acoustics because the line of sight is clear, usually between the source and listener, you have a single enclosure, and that means that diffraction effects are wave effects can boost accuracy, so they're good to have, but they don't entirely forestall um, using ray methods. You can actually get good approximations using it. So for further reading, uh, Dirk Schroeder's thesis is a, uh, is a good resource to learn about uh, ray tracing methods for real-time oralization. And there's also, below that is an overview or survey paper on geometric techniques. So from room acoustics, we know how to characterize propagation with, with the concept of an impulse response. And the idea is that if you have a source and listener in a room, you play an impulsive sound like a clap or a balloon pop from the source, and you record what the listener gets. That's the impulse response. And once you know the impulse response, then later on, whichever signal the source emits, you can do a convolution of the impulse response with it to recreate how it would sound when it's filtered through the room. So that's the key trick that lets you separate whatever sound you're going to play on later with uh, the, the transfer or the effect of the room on the sound or the space on the sound. And there's a lot of knowledge we already have on the structure of a typical impulse response. So say you have the situation as shown on the right. So initially you'll have a direct path or initial sound propagating from the source to the listener. That's the, that's the initial spike here. 
Then you'll have a few bounces from geometry uh, in the room. That's the early reflections. And these are clearer, and they convey spatial presence, like proximity to surfaces. And then over time, you have much more complex paths, and it gets very noisy. And that's late reverberation. So I'm telling you this because it sets some vocabulary that I'll be going back to as we go ahead. Finally, you can assign directions to each of these arrivals at the listener. And that gives you what's called the directional impulse response. And the directional impulse response is sufficient information to give you the whole sound feel around the listener, that the sound was heard from here, a reflection came from the left, and so on. So I told you about room acoustics and the use of ray tracing methods. In interactive audio, you have a different set of problems because the line of sight is obstructed many, many times. It's a very common scenario. And this can be summarized with what's called the lamppost problem. And the idea is, suppose you used a simple system to model obstruction, which is you traced a ray from the source to listener and you said, if there's anything in the way, I'm going to reduce the loudness of the sound by some amount. Now the issue is if you have thin geometry like a lamppost, small motions of the listener can uh, have the line, line of sight clear or obstructed and create these loudness fluctuations, which you don't hear in real life, and it's, uh, it's immersion breaking. A complementary problem is the pinhole problem, which is if you have, say, non-watertight meshes, so there's little apertures or gaps between triangles, then suddenly you can hear a sound with full loudness as it goes uh, as you establish line of sight, which is also unintuitive. In reality, what you expect is as the size of the obstruction or the aperture changes smoothly, the loudness of the sound adjusts smoothly as well, which is closer to physics. And that's because of diffraction. So it becomes quite indispensable in interactive applications for producing natural results that are robust and don't um, change too harshly over space. They stay smooth. So I've been talking about diffraction. Let me show you what it looks like. So on the right, you see a wave simulation, which is using a grid solver on, to model a volume of air and all the pressure fluctuations within it. I'm showing compressions with red and rarefactions with green. So as the source emits the sound, the wavefront wraps around this obstruction to get to the listener. That's diffraction, that sound waves tend to bend around obstacles. So we need to model this to solve the lamppost problem and the pinhole problem. But there are many more acoustic effects that are of interest in interactive audio that also don't have line of sight. One of them is portaling, which is the everyday experience that sounds redirect around doors. And you tend to hear coming from doors rather than wherever the source is in line of sight. And that's, again, because sounds bend around and diffract around these door edges. And if you have multiple sources in a room, like on the left, you expect the sounds to funnel through a doorway and arrive at you. And this helps a lot in um, helping the listener localize themselves and situate themselves in a space. Then there's occlusion, which is just the total power uh, of the sound, including initial sound and reflections. Then there's reverberance or wet ratio, which is that um, a listener behind a partition in this case will get a weaker initial sound compared to a listener right in front of a source whereas the reverberation in both cases is similar. So when you're behind the partition, the sound is more echoey, it's, it's more reverberant, and that conveys the impression that you're in a different space from the sound source. And this is, this is hard to fake by hand. It's, it's common to tune this using just distance in games, but clearly that's not enough in complex scenes. Finally, there's decay time, which is that just that a bigger room with the same material uh, reverberates for longer than a small room. So these are some of the effects that are of interest. It, this, is, this was not an uh, exhaustive list of effects, but this gives you some sense of the sort of scenarios faced in interactive audio. Now, these were simple scenes for illustration, but in reality, scenes can be much more complex. Uh, so this, this is a, a more representative scene. Uh, there's a cathedral on the left. I've taken the roof off. We're looking at it top down. And if you think about what the initial sound looks like in this scenario, it emits from the source, and say the listener is inside. So it emits from the source, it has to diffract many, many times around various edges, wrap around it to flow to the listener. 
and there are other complex paths also involved in the initial sound. Reflections and reverberation look much more complex. You have many, many complicated paths that connect the source to listener. So modeling all this in real time can get really compute intensive. And that's why games typically use techniques like reverb volumes, where a designer would say, um, I'll just draw this box around the cathedral, and where, whenever the listener enters this box, I'm going to turn on such and such filter, cathedral impulse response. And then I'm going to just use that filter on the sound to convey that you're inside a cathedral. The difficulty with that is you end up having to draw many, many volumes. This is a lot of tedious work, and it's error prone, it's bug prone. It's just a lot of manual work that, uh, that requires a lot of time investment. So to solve these issues, a lot of interactive sound propagation systems have been proposed to automate this process. The systems on the left use geometric approximation, ray tracing techniques that I talked about. So Steam Audio and Google Resonance don't model diffraction, but they focus on reverberation modeling and spatialization. Wise Reflect tries to model uh, diffraction, such as portaling and um, obstruction effects, but um, it requires a simplified acoustic mesh. So you have to take your scene and make a simplified version that's watertight because it has the pinhole problem. Um, and then you have to do some markup for the doors. And then if the scene gets very complex, the CPU cost starts going up. So there's a trade-off there to balance. On the other hand is Triton, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, which uses the wave simulation, like the simulations I just showed you. So it does full physical modeling. It includes all the diffraction effects. But the cost for that is pre-computation, which does bring its limitations, which I'll get into. So to give you some background, Project Triton is something I've been leading in Microsoft Research since 2010 in collaboration with John Snyder and over the years, many different product partners. And it's, it's the first physics system that was used in a game to provide uh, physical propagation effects like obstruction and dynamic reverb, uh, which was Gears of War in 2016. And there's a GDC talk uh, below that talks about that particular integration that might be of interest. So let me show you some demos of the system in Gears of War. Um, so in this particular scene, there's only one sound source, the helicopter. And I'm going to give you a baseline first with no acoustics, so it's just distance attenuation. And then I'm going to switch Triton on and show you what it sounds like, especially how the obstruction sounds like in various spaces. So again, this was driven directly from the geometry and the materials of the scene. And note how the obstruction effects are giving you a sense of where the helicopter is. And without even looking, you can sense whether you're in immediate danger from it versus not. So such effects are pretty important in games. The second demo shows uh, uh, more uh, how the reverberation varies in a small room versus a big room versus outdoors. And again, first I'll start with off to set a baseline and then turn it on. I'd say it's about time we got the hell out of here. Hey, are we not going to talk about what happened back there? With the nest? I mean, what the hell was that? It looked like they were transforming. Wait, you mean like evolving? But shouldn't that take a lot of time? I'd say it's about time we got the hell out of here. Hey, are we not going to talk about what happened back there? With, with the, the nest? nest? I mean, what the hell was that? Looked like they were transforming. Wait, you mean like evolving? But shouldn't that take a lot of time? Well, some insect juveniles can become drones in days, hours even. So, juvies and drones. 
Julie's in charge of what, though? I have a feeling we're going to find out. So, audio plays almost a subconscious role in boosting the sense of space. As they're having a conversation to various spaces, without looking too much around, they have a sense of where they are. And that's the importance of audio in these experiences. This demo shows occlusion on rain sounds and how they vary naturally throughout a space. So you get these smooth, nice variations throughout the space, and this would be very hard to do by hand because you'd have to paint a loudness map through the scene saying how loud the range should be everywhere, which is quite infeasible in practice. So since Gears of War 4, Triton has shipped in many more games and in virtual reality, so it does uh, provide some confidence that it's a practical system today for any experience. Um, it has shipped in virtual reality experiences like Windows Mixed Reality and Allspace VR. Uh, sea of Thieves used it to provide obstruction effects. For example, if you're below deck in a ship and there's somebody above deck, they're very close to you in, in the sense of distance, but their sound should be very muffled, and Triton is able to model such effects. Gears 5 in 2019 showed that you can how you can combine I was telling you about propagation and spatialization. So Gears 5 is a good showcase combining how you can use good sound simulation uh, and combine that with later spatialization technologies like Dolby Atmos and Windows Sonic to produce a much more immersive experience. And finally, Borderlands 3 is, is interesting in being the first product that's not from Microsoft to use this technology. And talking about external usage, uh, Triton is available externally in the form of Project Acoustics, and which is you can download from this link. And it takes Triton, it takes our HRTF technology that's used in Windows Sonic and HoloLens, and it makes them easy to use as plugins for Unity and Unreal. So they can be they can be very easy to use for for example for research purposes or commercially. There's a GDC talk here showing the workflow uh, and the use cases for the technology. And it's pretty cross-platform across consoles, PC. We have an Android demo. Uh, it works in virtual reality. And I'll be showing you a demo on the HoloLens later on. So let me give you a technical flavor of the main ideas behind Triton and why it's practical. The first idea is I told you that uh, we want to model diffraction. So the way to model that is to do a wave simulation, which is a grid solution of the volume of air. And that's very expensive. That's way, way more expensive than ray tracing. So the first idea is do it beforehand. Pre-compute this wave simulation on a static scene. And you get a simulation in a complex scene. The simulation would look something like this. So you take a potential listener location. You send out a probe signal, which is a pulse. Those wave fronts propagate out through the scene, and then you put microphones throughout the scene. So at point A, you're get, starting to getting, get some signal, then the waves wrap around over the walls and get to point B. And essentially, you're, you're collecting these acoustic impulse responses that I told you about that characterize what happened to the sound on its way from the source to listener. And in practice, for Every such simulation, we collect millions of impulse responses. And then we repeat this procedure for a lot of possible samplings of listener locations. So that shifts the problem from computation to memory, because we know the answer in terms of the impulse response. So at runtime, it's just a table lookup to find what the impulse response should be. But the difficulty is this is terabytes of data. So we have a compression problem. So the second idea comes in that instead of keeping the impulse responses, we know the sort of effects we're after, like obstruction, occlusion. So we figure out which parameters perceptually capture those effects, and we just extract those out. So the example here is you, you compute the onset delay, the initial delay of the sound, loudness and direction for the initial sound, 
for the reflections you have the initial delay for the first reflection and then some overall distribution of the energy of those reflections so to capture some spatial or directional aspects of them and then for reverberation you have a decay time so in all the details here don't matter so much um, the main idea is you've gone from this long signal in time to 12 numbers that are perceptually meaningful and that's a lot of compression right there that brings us to the third idea now you can take how these parameters vary over space so for example I've shown initial direction and loudness here you can uh, you can see how they vary over space and map out what are called parameter fields and when you map them out you see for ex you see that they're pretty smooth so in this case you can see the color which is loudness is varying very smoothly similarly the direction is pretty constant over most of space so you can do compression on this for example you can use an image compressor on such smooth images and reduce the data so all in all that reduces the RAM from roughly 100 terabytes to 100 megabytes which is a factor of a million compression and that makes it practical to load up this data uh, at runtime in a game and the CPU is small because we pre compute it so it's just uh, table lookups and interpolations at runtime so it's just 100 microseconds to take a source and figure out what its acoustic parameters should be given its location and the listeners location so here's uh, some more demos this one is showing more of the obstruction portaling and the spatial audio effects that I was talking about and this is a long demo it's about two minutes and you should read the captions up top and they will describe to you what you should be hearing So these effects that you heard, especially towards the end, where the sounds are opening up, the soundscape opens up when you walk into a space and folds back down into doors as you walk out, they're pretty difficult to do without modeling physically and modeling diffraction in real time. So here's some more recent work. This is, this is pretty exciting. This is uh, showing, for the first time, I believe, uh, diffraction and obstruction effects in mixed reality and I highly recommend going to this talk at the link below uh, which talks about the system in more detail uh, but essentially we're using depth scan geometry of the space to drive acoustics so it's showing just one sound source and it's showing how it's obstructed and gets portaled around doors within a real space so what you're seeing is a live capture through a HoloLens 2 and Again, it shows first acoustics disabled, then enabled.
So these are initial results for sure, but they're very promising. So if you have lots of people in this room, you could expect to reproduce the effect of when you're outside, there's chatter in a room heard through a door, and you walk in and the soundscape envelops you in mixed reality. So some of the participants could be real, some could be virtual, for example. So let me go back to my rubric that I showed initially and talk about how Triton fits within that, how it represents one possible practical solution for interactive propagation. So by doing wave simulation, we can model general scenes because it's the first principle solution. And we get believability and robustness because we're modeling diffraction. And it's also highly automatic because we just take the scene geometry and voxelize it for a grid solver. So there's no need for a spe special simplified geometry for running the acoustic simulation. It's also very efficient because we pre-compute everything and compress it down. And this I didn't get into much, but because we're using these perceptual parameters, audio engines um, are pretty good at parametric rendering. So there's a way to map these parameters onto standard audio engines to do the rendering. So it does not require complete changes to audio engines to enable these, which has played a big part in why we were able to ship it in Gears of War to begin with. And finally, there's design control. And because these parameters are meaningful, there are things like, how much loudness do you hear? A designer can say, change that, change whatever physics computed. So do a little more obstruction than what physics wanted, or do a little less obstruction than what it wanted. Or the designer could say, I want this space to be a bit more reverberant than what its materials and volume would suggest for artistic effect. So they can just say a multiplier, for example, make it 1.5 times whatever physics said. The important thing is the designer is not having to say, the acoustics should be such and such. They can simply say, I like it most of the time, but in these places, modify it, the, whatever the acoustics is physically in such and such way, which is much less manual labor and much more time for the artistic work that they want to do. The issue is that we can't handle dynamic scenes because it's pre-computed. So we have to bake the geometry. We have to know it beforehand. To some extent, this problem is solvable, although not completely. So if you know that the dynamic geometry is going to be in places you already know about, such for example, such as doors, then one can do something about it. So this is a demo from very recent work I did on modeling doors within Triton. And what you have here are two sound sources. There's a storm outside, there's water dripping inside. And look how the door modifies and affects the two sounds. So what the system is doing is using pre-computed data and combining it with whatever the state of closure of the door is in real time. So the door could be in any state and the sound would adjust to it. And this shows that to some extent, uh, including dynamic effects is possible. But fully dynamic geometry is difficult. So th that hopefully gave you some technical flavor um, of Triton. And to learn more about it, I refer you to the papers. I won't go through these details. But if there's one paper you read, it's uh, I would suggest starting with the second one, which introduces the main idea behind parametric compression. To recap, uh, Triton um, is a practical solution for doing sound propagation, including all physical aspects like diffraction. And it's been used in practice. So it shows that for interactive sound propagation, uh, you can have practical solutions that can ship in games today. But it's definitely not the final answer because it's limited to mostly static scenes. And my view of it is more like light baking in games, which is a standard technology and it's, it's motivated from similar considerations that doing the whole light transport simulation in real time can be very difficult. 
So you do it beforehand and then you layer some dynamic stuff on top of it. But like lighting, uh, sound for sound, the next frontier would be fully dynamic scenes. That's where lighting is going as well to model all these phenomena uh, in real time. Except for sound, we'll also have to worry about diffraction. And that would that's a much harder problem, but that's also a much more interesting problem as well. And that would require innovation in fast wave solvers to model diffraction, hybridizing wave-based methods with ray tracing methods to use both of their strengths, and then worry about scalability to much larger scenes because game scenes are becoming bigger and bigger. So that's my talk. Uh, let me give you uh, some sense for the future. I, today I talked about sound simulation and its three main components, synthesis, propagation, and spatialization, and spent a lot of time giving you some sense of uh, propagation and Triton. The future for sound simulation is very promising. Uh, because of all these different applications that are lining up in the near future, uh, there's a lot of interest in such technology. For example, in virtual reality, you have much more close and nuanced interactions with individual objects. So synthesis becomes quite important uh, to, to, so as to not break the immersion. In mixed reality, um, the North Star is to have convincing interactions, have virtual holograms of people that share the space with you. And modeling their acoustic effects um, in a convincing way can um, move the state of the art that much forward and create some really compelling experiences. Games continue their march forward on immersion and realism, and it's great that audio is catching up now and more and more immersive audio simulation will be needed to, to have audio visual immersion in games. Then there's applications in accessibility for vision impaired users, uh, where audio becomes the primary sensory cue. And there's been some work in the ability team in Microsoft Research um, who used Triton in their cane controller project to train blind users to use a virtual cane uh, in more complex environments. So for example, in a two-room environment with a wall in between, the propagation and portaling cues can help inform a person which way to walk and not run into walls. And finally, there's building an urban acoustics where the application would be immersive walkthroughs and noise control applications. And Especially in architecture right now, there's a digital transformation going on. It's becoming more and more common to have a whole digital model of the building and to do walkthroughs within game engines. So uh, sound simulation can provide the acoustic component, important acoustic component to those experiences. So that was my talk. Thanks for attending. And please stick around for the live Q&A. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks for attending my talk today. It's Nikunj here, and I hope you enjoyed it, uh, uh, my discussion of interactive sound simulation. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be answering some of your the top questions here, and there's, there's been a lot of questions, so I'm just sorting them in real time here. Uh, so let's, let's just get going. So the first thing I'll say is some of you are talking about just the videos and the sound is coming out as mono uh, or you have some delays in the audio and video. So I'll say in the resource list to your right, uh, the presentation slide deck is available right on top. So you can uh, download that and see it and view it at your leisure with a good headphone setup whenever you want. Okay, so uh, let's get to the technical questions. One of the questions is, what is lost in this com perceptual compression process? And if you do an A-B listening test, do you hear a difference? And the answer is yes, you definitely hear a difference. There are many things left to do. In our compressor, we basically started with saying, what will fit within the resource constraints of a game and sound reasonable, and add realism as we go from there. That's been the process here. So some of the things we know are missing, are a big one that's missing is uh, discrete reflections. When you're outdoors, you get slapback echoes. And we have one reflection delay, but really uh, you need a few reflections uh, to get an immersive sense of a space. 
So that's something that we're working on. And similarly, there are other things related to that, like outdoors doesn't sound as good because a lot of our work has been based on room acoustic theory. So things tend to sound like rooms with our system, but we do have this outdoorness factor that we use to make outdoors sound better. But basically, there's a lot to dig here. So it's really, there's a lot of fun research to do in this area of uh, parametric compression for interactive audio. All right, next question. Uh, so somebody tested out the technique and they're saying it's too, it sounds too echoey in some cases. And the related question is, do we handle frequency dependent boundaries? No, we don't. And that could be a reason it can be a bit echoey sometimes. And this is something we're actively working on right now because real acoustic materials have reflectivity that depends heavily on frequency. So we're, we're actively in the process of adding that uh, but it will it will take a while. We don't have a uh, ETA on that currently, but that's something we're looking into and we know that it's an issue for sure. Uh, one thing I'd say is if it's too echoey in some cases, you can definitely, in our Unreal Immunity plugins, you can definitely edit the material reflectivity. So we just have a flat frequency independent reflectivity and you can easily change that. So if, if things are too echoey, that's one way to tone them down, to bring down those, to increase those absorptivities or reduce the reflectivities, whatever the case may be. All right, so after that, let's see. So one question was related to uh, pre-computation, like uh, why is Azure required and where does the pre-computation happen? How long does it take? So the idea is that this wave simulation is very expensive. So we need a compute cluster for this thing to do this pre-computation in a reasonable amount of wall clock time. And the good thing is each of these simulations that I've been showing you can be done independently. So if you go really wide and allocate a lot of machines, then the simulations can finish in, in even half an hour. And that's why that's one of the reasons we, when we ship these plugins, we made Azure the uh, the default option is that lets you, Azure Batch lets you do that very easily and gives you reasonable turnaround times. But I will add that the Unity plugin does have the option of doing these simulations locally, but they do take much longer because it's only a single machine that's doing it. Another question is, is the source code for Project Acoustics available? Uh, so we are making it available through the GDK program. So for game developers, if you already have a GDK agreement in place to use it for Xbox to ship your games, then we made it very easy uh, with a one-page agreement for you to get the source code access uh, for free for Project Acoustics. And a related question is, is Triton available for research purposes? Uh, the answer to that is uh, that the plugins are designed explicitly for that. We definitely encourage you to use it for all kinds of applications, and we look forward to what you use it for. Let's see, next question. How do the CPU and RAM usage of Triton scale with scene size? And another question, related question was, how does it scale across platforms? So answering the platform question first, because it's pre-computed, the CPU cost tends to be on the low side because we're not doing that much compute on the fly. So um, we've actually, uh, in terms of platforms, we've actually had it run on an Android phone, although you will have to test to see how, many, how much source count you can support. Uh, in, on the Xbox, certainly you can throw many tens of sources at it, uh, or with the prioritization scheme, even hundreds of sources at it, and it works. Uh, but uh, I would say on a mobile phone, for example, or a lightweight VR platform, Definitely a few sources, but the exact numbers are uh, difficult. But it's, it does work in real time on an Android phone. We've tested that much. And as you saw on the HoloLens also it works, which is a similar mobile processor. And as to how it scales with scene size, the baking will cost more, but the CPU and RAM usage can be held pretty still because uh, we have streaming support, so you don't load up the whole data set into memory but you can uh, tile it up and load it piecemeal. And that's already supported in our Unreal and Unity plugins. And the CPU cost itself is quite insensitive to scene size. 
All right, and we have some more questions coming in. Let's see. So there was a question about connections to graphics research, uh, like spherical projections and uh, transfer functions, and if, it, if this technology could be uh, used for electromagnetic waves or global illumination. There's definitely connections there because the core technology here is a wave solver, although the perceptual compression portion is not as relevant there. But yes, some of these ideas of like pre-computing and compressing have applications there. In fact, there are very close parallels to pre-computed lighting. And my longtime collaborator on this project, John Snyder, he made some original contributions in that area. So we're well aware of the connections here. And yeah, if, uh, this, this is an interesting area for sure. Um, let's see. Just looking for some more questions here. Right, so one question is, what is the increase in uh, memory usage for the doors feature I showed at the end? And it doesn't cost any extra memory. It, like, the, it, the extra memory is very minimal. Um, you just need to have one more listener location at each door, which is you probably already have anyhow. Uh, the cost is more on the CPU side. And this, this is a new feature that some of our partners are trying out. And so far, we haven't heard complaints about its CPU cost either. Uh, because it, it's not, for example, it is not doing a global search in the scene to figure out which doors are on the path. It's leveraging the data that's already pre-computed, specifically the delay data. Uh, so it's, we hope it's a pretty lightweight extension, frankly. Um, Okay, a question after that. It's a very boring question. What are the costs of Azure Cloud Compute? Uh, just rough numbers. So you could, uh, it's, it costs two cents, roughly speaking, just ballpark. It costs two cents of it on Azure Low Priority to do one of the big simulations I showed you. And in, in a typical scene, you'll have a thousand-ish probes. Like a Gears of War scene is uh, on the scale of, say, one to 2,000 probes. So you can do the math from there. It's a few tens of dollars to make a decent, like big-sized game scene. All right. So just going through more questions here. So one question is, are you using a hybrid method for numerical acoustics? for lower mid frequencies and geometric acoustics for high frequencies. Currently, we're not. Currently, we're finding that if you can simulate up to, say, one kilohertz, then most of the building scale diffraction effects that, uh, that are important in virtual reality and games, like obstruction effects, you can get a, um, you can get a good handle on them. But certainly, um, it, it's a very interesting direction to look into. Uh, all right, so I think, um, yeah, just sorting through the questions here. What is the typical resolution for the spatial simulation grid queried by games? Uh, it's a, presumably it's a compromise for memory usage. Yes, it is. And so how many listener positions typically? So I, I think I already answered that. It's a few thousand positions, and the resolution is on the scale of meters. Um, so that's the resolution on the listener side. It's, it's in a few meters range. So of course, if your scene is smaller, you can sample more densely. But uh, for if you have high resolution needs over a vast scene, then you probably want to section it up into various data sets, which is feasible to do. Oh, here's a fun question, how to use it for underwater sounds. Uh, I think you can't, <laughs> but I'd love somebody for, to try it. <laughs> it would be interesting. Um, for, for sure, like what people do in ocean acoustics, it's, it won't work for those sort of engineering scenarios because the physics is very different. You have layer density, so speed of sound changes with depth, and there's lots, of, lots more effects to, to worry about. So the basic physics we're assuming here is quite different. 
But if if what you mean here is uh, for artistic effect for underwater sounds, then then perhaps uh, something could be done to take the parameters and tweak them in a certain way to to give the sort of underwater artistic underwater effect that games go for. And okay, yeah, this is a good question that I that highlights the limitation. So wave methods are pretty computationally intensive. So how are you doing it for the full bandwidth? And the answer there is we're not, as I mentioned earlier. So what we do is we just assume the parameters we computed for, say, up to 500 hertz or 1 kilohertz, we just apply them for the full bandwidth, which is not the right answer. And it also goes to, uh, to the point about A-B comparison and accuracy. Is This is good for um, to, as a starting point, but we definitely want to make the solver faster. And our intuition up to now is if we can pull off one to two kilohertz, then for most scenarios that we've seen till now, things work out quite well. Um, okay, so, and this is going to be my last question. And if I didn't get to um, your question, please feel free to email me. I, I'm uh, loving the questions I got here, and I'm very happy to answer them later as well. So this question is, can you scale the voxel grid resolution and does it change the cloud processing time or real-time performance and quality? So we do cover it in the docs and you can uh, reduce the simulation frequency. And we've actually, for preview grade oralizations, even 250 hertz does something reasonable and it computes much faster as well. The loss there is that your voxels are so, so big that windows and doors can be just filled in by the voxels. So that's the loss in quality. In terms of real-time performance, it's the same, really. So changing the res resolution changes only the bake time, how much cost you uh, pay during baking. All right, so uh, to wrap up here, thank you so much for uh, your interest in, the, in my talk today. And definitely look at the resource list to your right. I've, um, there's a link to the deck itself, the Triton research page, and also a link to Project Acoustics um, toolset, and also to the Project Acoustics forums. So that's also a great place to ask us questions if you're thinking about um, uh, a fit, uh, the fit for this for a particular research project or a product that you're thinking of. And then there's a few publications and related podcasts. The last link is something that went live very recently. It talks about the audio research in general at MSR. So it also talks about the HRTF research that I touched on briefly that's happened in Microsoft Research. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I really just look forward to what you all do with this, uh, with this tool set. We're really hoping that uh, that was that's the intent behind making it so widely available is people experiment with it. You try it out for your projects. You see uh, what works, what doesn't. You can you're welcome always to come onto the forums uh, and tell us uh, what you found missing so we can keep improving it. And also that informs our research on this going forward. And that's it. And I'll reiterate that. Please feel free to email me if you have questions you need answers to. So thank you so much for attending and your interest and have a great day.